Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. How are you? Well, if you were to read the Bible for the very first time, one of the things that would jump out right off the bat is that there's a lot of miracles in there. I mean, God is always doing these miraculous book of the Bible, and you see just miracle after miracle. You see the Israelites, they're in slavery in Egypt, and then they're released through miracles, through plagues and the Red Sea opening. And then when they're trying to go into the, uh, into the promised land, Joshua's leading them in there and there's obstacles there. And so Joshua has the Israelites circle Jericho and then the walls come falling down and you go through to the prophets like Daniel. Daniel's thrown into the lion's den, hungry lions. He should be eaten. He's not because of a miracle. He prays and God intervenes. And his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're thrown into a fiery furnace. Certainly they should be burned up, but they're not. Again, another miracle. And then you go through the New Testament, you see the same pattern over and over. You see Jesus with 5,000 plus people, and he feeds them with five loaves of bread and two fish, or he walks on the water, or he raises the dead. And you see the same thing with the apostles. With Peter, he raises somebody from the dead. He heals this lame person who's at the temple. And then through church history, you see just healing after healing. And it's just a this, this treasure trove of history of healing. And even in the vineyard movement, you can't really talk about the vineyard without talking about healing and health. It's part of our, our, part of, uh, our movement that's been going on now for 35 years. So if it's so much part of the Christian church, why aren't people flooding into the church looking for healing? Going, hey, I've gone from doctor to doctor. I've gone from test to test. I've tried this medication, that medication, and I'm stuck in this place where I need healing. I need healing uh, psychologically. And I need physical healing. I need spiritual healing. Why don't they just flood in and, and, and say, can God help me? You know, can God heal me? We don't see that. In fact, sometimes we see the opposite. We see people associating uh, the church like with, with, with uh, getting worse. Uh, one example is Francis McNutt, who was a formal Catholic priest, and he believed and taught in healing and divine healing, said that one time he, uh, he one of his parishioners, was, was ill, and so he's going to go visit him in the hospital. He calls the parishioner's brother and says, I'd like to visit your brother in the hospital. He goes, oh, Father, please don't. He goes, my brother is pretty sick, and I'm concerned that if you come and visit him, he'll think he's worse than he is, and he'll actually go into a tailspin. You know, so how is it that you know, the church somehow has been now relegated? To, uh, we, you know, if you come and that means I'm, I'm really sick, you know, if, you're just like coming to do last rites or something. Well, the fact is, when we look at Scripture, when we look at church history, when we look at who God is, if God is the same of the Bible, the same God we serve today, the same Holy Spirit, then God is still involved in healing. And we want to be involved in that. We want to step into that, and it's partly our, our birthright as Christ followers. It's our, it's our heritage that we get to step in and say, I want to be part of that. And the world certainly needs it. The world needs it. Now, there's some obstacles that get in the way of God using us for divine healing. And so we're going to look at a story that I think 
Uh, certainly there's a lot of, of, uh, of obstacles today, but there was, there was some in the, in, in, that we see in the Bible, and we're going to unpack one of these. There's actually kind of, in John 5, if you have your Bibles, open it up to John, Gospel of John chapter 5, or open up your Bible apps. If you don't have one, download them, they're free, download, so you can follow along. We're going to be looking at the NIV, and there we see kind of a template of divine healing. We see God healing, Jesus healing somebody, and then some of the obstacles that, that, uh, that were there that were present in the story that can sometimes sideline us if we're not careful. John chapter 5, they're beginning in verse 1. Now, the first obstacle is a issue of worldview, a problem of worldview. And I'll talk to you about what that means in a second. Let's look at these first three verses. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool which is in Aramaic called Bethesda and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here is a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. Now we're not sure exactly what feast it was. There's a number of feasts. There's the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Pentecost, the, the Feast of Passover. We're not sure which feast, but here he goes in uh, at one of these feast times, and he says there that uh, he was near the sheep gate, a pool which in Aramaic is called Bethesda. Now there's different gates that give access to uh, to the uh, to the old Jerusalem, which is still there today, and and uh, the sheep gate or where the pool of Bethesda is, is is actually right near the Temple Mount. It would be where uh, they're putting up these metal detectors since just a few weeks ago, a couple of Israeli security were shot. So they put in the metal detector gates and then there's been this big uprising you've been seeing in the news. And so just uh, three days ago, they took those metal detector gates away and now have metal detector wands and they're, they're profiling, deciding who they're wanding and who they're not. Well, this is right where this is located. Interesting, you know, there was... Uh, there was a uh, people, archaeologist, that said that John didn't know what he was talking about. That there was no, this is a little over a century ago, they said there, there's no uh, Bethesda. John got this wrong. He didn't really know what he was talking about. He's kind of distant and removed in writing this. He had written it uh, after it, uh, 70 AD, they believed. And so they said he, they didn't really know what, uh, what, John didn't know what it looked like. Uh, before 70 A.D., because in 70 A.D. is when the Romans came in and destroyed Jerusalem. And so he, he said, well, he's just making this up. But then, in the beginning of the 20th century, archaeologists dug down and actually found this pool. They found it was the pool of Bethesda. They said, oh, wow, look, here it is, just like it's described in the Bible with these five uh, uh, porticles or colonnades with the columns all around and, uh, and then they said, well, he didn't really know. Uh, he just made up the term because we weren't sure it was at that point still that it was called Bethesda. They said, oh, they just, you know, he made that up. And then when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in 1945, there was references to this healing pool called the Pool of Bethesda. And that was hidden away for 2,000 years. Nobody had touched it. And all of a sudden they found out, no, John actually didn't make this up. There's, the name is right. The place is right. When uh, we took a Holy Land tour with some of the people here in the, in the vineyard, we actually went to there, and it's right there. You go down, and it's, you, there's still water there. There's the, the healing pool. And so Jesus was there, and he was healing. It's a real place. It's not just like a, a fable, like Aesop's fables that has moral teachings or, you know, uh, uh, like uh, Plato's Republic and uh, with... with uh, the lessons that come from, no, this is, you take a shovel, you dig down, you actually find it. And some of Jesus' contemporaries, not just his friends that wrote the Bible, but also people that were, were not his friends, Josephus and others, actually referred to Jesus a number of times, saying Jesus was a miracle worker. Some called him a magician. But he was known as someone who did miracles. So it's actual history. And uh, when we look at this story, we see, uh, it goes on in verse 4, it says, uh, 
Uh, now, some of you don't have verse 4. Actually, most of you wouldn't, only if you have one older Bible, because r- more recent manuscripts have discovered that verse really was added after the fact. And there, so it says, that's why I put it in italics on your outline. It says, and they waited for the moving of the waters. From time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. The first one into the pool, after it reached, such disturbance would be cured of whatever disease he had. So now, verse 4 was, like I said, was, was added after the fact, but it finds its cooperation from verse 7. Uh, Sir, the invalid said, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else gets, goes down ahead of me. So this is kind of the tradition of, of that pool, is, is that they would lay there around the pool. When the water would get stirred in some way, uh, they would say, oh, hey, there's an angel there. There's, this is a moment of healing. And so they would try to get in. This guy's lame. He's at a, dis- a disadvantage. He can't, everybody seems to beat him in. But his worldview is what Jesus comes and, and challenges because his worldview was is that was only, the only way he was going to get healed. He had, been th- he had been there, coming there day after day, and maybe he lived there. Maybe, that's, maybe, maybe he didn't have a home and people just brought him food. But his, in his worldview, that was the only way he was going to get healed. And if he could somehow either get touched by this angel or get in these waters when healing was going to happen. And so we have a similar worldview sometimes. When we, our worldview is, is, this is how our healing is going to take place. I have this emotional baggage, this emotional disability. I need to be healed. And so if I go to the right therapist, I'll just go and keep finding a therapist. And once I find the right one, then I'll get the insight, the breakthrough that I need. Or I have this, uh, this uh, physical uh, I- uh, injury or illness. And the only way, so I'll keep going to doctor after doctor. I'll try different medications. I'll go through different surgical procedures. My healing is going to happen through the medical profession. And that's generally where it is, right? I mean, most of us, because I, I like modern medicine as much as anybody, but I see it as a vehicle, one vehicle of God's healing. It's a gift of healing from God. But a lot, many people, they don't see it. They, that's their only, their only way. Science, it's medicine. It's like the doctor, it's like the scientist who goes to God and says, says, uh, I don't need you anymore. We don't need you. We can clone our own, pe- our own humans. Uh, we, can, we can do things without you. Uh, and so we don't need you anymore. So God says to the scientist, he says, okay, well, I want to give you a, a challenge, a competition. Whoever, before I let you go, be whoever can make a human out of dirt, the first wins. And the scientist goes, no problem, I can do that. And so he reaches down and God goes, oh, wait a minute, you make your own dirt. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, God is really, even though we have science to help us, God is the one who is, is, is the reason things have been created. God is the one who intervenes. God is the one who is in charge of not only history, but our future and our present. And so a worldview is like glasses, it's like a lens, and only God sees it the way it really is. We all have certain perspectives we, appro- we approach life with, and we see it with certain lenses, certain perspectives, and, and God challenges it. He challenges it for this person, and he challenges it in, in our lives as well. The next is the problem of technique. Technique. Healing was to come a certain way according to this guy, and he's explaining it to Jesus. Who is the healer? He says, Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool. When the water is stirred, when I am, while I am trying to get in, someone else goes ahead of me. So here he is. He's actually explaining to Jesus who is the healer, how it's supposed to go down. This is the way it has to happen. And this is this is a problem of technique. We, we think we know the way it's going to happen. Well, I have this emotional healing that needs to happen. But it'll never happen until my mother admits to me and asks for forgiveness for what she did and the way she raised me. And I, I have this, this uh, emotional baggage, this healing that needs to happen. It's not gonna, I'm not going to get healed until I find the right mate and I marry them, and then I'll, 
and then I'll be whole. Or until I have a child, then I'll find my emotional healing. You know, I, I, I have this, this, this problem, this, uh, this void in my life, this, this illness that seems to just hang over me, this depression, this sadness. And if my husband or my wife figure out what their problem is, deal with their issues, then I'll be happy again. I mean, we've got our technique. This is the way it's happening. If, if this happens, then I'll be better. And it's a problem of technique because the truth is that instead of looking to a per, for another person, we, look, we should be looking to Jesus. You know, it's not, it's not out there. It's not, we, sometimes we concoct the way we think it's supposed to happen instead of going to God. And, the tr- and God has his own way of bringing healing. Sometimes it surprises us. Sometimes we're surprised at how, how, how God's process of bringing healing into a life is different than, than our own. Sometimes in just counseling with people, I'll talk to them, they'll go, you know what, I, it's, it's, it's this technique of insight. If I just, I'll get this breakthrough of insight if I just you know, get the right therapist. If I read the right book, if I go to the right conference, then I will be able to uh, get healed. But Instead of focusing on the healing pool and the technique of that, we should be focusing on Christ himself. And this is, this is really uh, what Jesus is doing to this person. You know, when we're ta- today I'm talking about how to pray. Uh, how do I pray for other people, Holy Spirit? Well, when we're looking, that's when we're looking to bring healing or bring uh, God's presence through praying for somebody, sometimes we look for a technique again. We'll look at what other people are doing. Well, how do they pray? And we see that they lay, you know, maybe they're laying their hands or maybe they shake their hand and they lean a little bit. Hey, if I do that, you know, maybe that's what I need. Maybe that's what's going to bring healing. But the truth is those techniques ultimately, they might work for them, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for you. You know, it's not, it's, 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 it's fine. It's finding Christ. It's really, God, I want, I want you in the midst of what I'm doing, whether I'm praying for somebody or whether I need, whether I need prayer for myself. Proverbs says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not under your own understanding, acknowledge him in all your ways and he will direct your path. So it's, 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 uh, looking to Christ, looking to God. And that's how healing and it's really a worldview a reli- over-reliance on techniques, those things have to be challenged. Then there's a problem of complacency. And what I mean by that is that sometimes people don't really want to be healed. Here that says in verses 5 and 6, one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get Well, now this question really could offend somebody, right? It could come off as insensitive. Somebody's been sick 38 years. I mean, he could say, well, why do you think I'm hanging here at the pool of Bethesda? I mean, somebody who comes up and wants prayer and they say, you know, I've I've had this long condition. uh, And and if I were to say, well, do you really want to get well? (laughs) They could go, well, why do you think I came for prayer? Why do you think I go to the doctor every other week? Why do you think I take so much medicine all the time. You think I do that for my health? Well, actually, they probably do do that for the health, right? <laughs> I mean, they're going to go, hey, that's, that's cruel. Why would you say that? But it's a valid question. It's a valid question. More and more, modern science is figuring that's, that's actually an issue. Started with uh, the father of modern psychiatry, Sigmund Freud pro- pro- proposed the secondary benefits from being sick. He said there was both social and personal benefits sometimes from continuing in sickness. And so this is a valid question. Do you you want to get well? Maybe not. Let me share with you from contemporary research what doctors say are some of the secondary gains from remaining sick. An attempt to elicit caregiving, sympathy, and concern from family and friends an attempt to ad- obtain a much-earned rest, the ability to, uh, to withdraw from unpleasant or unsatisfying life roles, activities or responsibilities, including those of being a breadwinner, displacing the blame for one's failures, from one's self to an apparently disabling illness beyond your control. 
holding on to a spouse or partner in a marriage or romantic relationship, avoiding sex, obtaining drugs, such as the national opioid crisis. So those are some of the potential benefits from remaining sick. And so do you want to get well is an actually an appropriate, an appropriate question. Do you want to get well? Now, certainly not everybody is in this category, but a complacency can affect all of us. All of us where we just fall into the rut of, of just complaining about our marriage, complaining about our life, and just, we just fall into, a, you know, hey, I'd, I'd like a better life. I'd like a better income, a better job. And we kind of get stuck there instead of saying, you know what, I'm going to change things. I'm going to go back to school. I'm going to get, get better trained. I'm going to get that college degree that I never got. I'm going to start, instead of complaining about my health all the time and my weight, I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to start checking, changing the way I eat. I'm going to get motivated. If that means I have to drive across town to get involved in an AA meeting, I'm done getting staying stuck with the same pattern of destructive behavior. So it's complacency. Do you really want to get well? Because there's things that we can do sometimes to take that step out of that. Jesus comes and he says, hey, do you want to get well? Makes that challenge. So in the back of your outline, the problem of disillusionment, verses 5 and 6 says, one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? You know, 38 years is a long time. And 38 years is, that's a chunk of your life. Now, some Bible scholars say that, that John is really just making a comparison to the Israelites when they were in a, in a bad place. 38 years in the desert. Deuteronomy there, I put it on your outline for you. 38 years passed from the time we left Kadesh Barnea until we crossed the Zered Valley. And then the entire generation of fighting men had perished from the camp as the Lord had sworn to them. Now, I don't know if John's is making an allegory. I think that's a big jump by the Bible scholars. I think that he saw the coincidence. It's not a coincidence. He said, hey, I see the connection. And John said, probably, I don't believe in coincidences. Look it, there's a connection there. But 38 years, obviously a very long time. And this guy could have easily gotten into a place where he thinks, if Jesus, if I'm not healed by now, God's probably not going to heal me, right? I'm just, you, get, you can get disillusioned. Uh, that happens to people all the time when they, if, if, all of us. I mean, if, if we pray for a while and then it doesn't seem to happen, and then we start to think, well, it's not, you know, we confuse it. It's maybe it's not a, a delay, it's just a denial. And then we just stop praying. We get, and that, that can be an obstacle to healing. When we have had a condition so long, we just, it's part of who we are now. It's part of our identity. That's who I am. I'm that kind of per, I'm that person with that illness. I'm that person with that, that, ha- that, that mental handicap, that mental challenge or whatever, whatever we're struggling with. We just, well, that's, I have that emotional disability. That's who I am. 38 years, we get disillusioned. We think, well, it's over now. You know, it's interesting. We, God heals for different reasons at different times. We, don't, we can't understand the mind of God. Somebody can come to this church for 10 years, for a decade, and never receive Christ. I always share the, the message of Jesus Christ, what Christ did for us, that we can, we, we can be at peace with God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, that he raised from the dead, that when we invite the Holy Spirit into our life, He gives us new life. Nearly every, every message, I talk about that because this in, this, in our church, our weekend service is the place where we, 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 we uh, invite the, the people who are far from God to hear the saving message of Christ. And we think about everything we do, the songs we choose, the transitions we do, the messages that I, everything we do, we're thinking about how can we reach our community and the people that listen online, how can we reach them for Jesus Christ? But sometimes it takes people a long time. We've had, like I said, people come for months, years, sometimes a decade, and then all of a sudden, you know, they've heard 500 sermons. This goes over them, whoop, 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 all 500. Then the 501st sermon, 
boom, the penny dropped, they get it. Wow, Jesus died for me. That's amazing. And they put their faith in Christ. Why, why didn't it happen on the 500th sermon or the 450th or the first one? It just sometimes God works in mysterious ways, right? I mean, some of you might have a story like that where you were raised in the church and you just heard it, you grew up with it, and all of a sudden one day it made sense. And you connected the dots. I get it. Jesus died for me and he, he loves me. And it makes sense that day. And this is how healing works sometimes, where we just, we just don't understand it sometimes. And earlier, uh, the, the uh, two chapters earlier, John talks about when Jesus is describing the Holy Spirit, he says the Holy Spirit is like a wind that blows. We can feel its effects, but we, don't, we can't see it. We don't know where it comes from. We don't know where it goes, but we feel its effects. And the Holy Spirit is like that. We pray for somebody, and sometimes there's a rush of, of wind, and they're healed. Other times it's just a gentle breeze, and they feel something. They feel God moving on them. Maybe there's an increased healing, but it's not complete instantaneous. That's more often the case, a gentle breeze. But, and we can't control the breeze. We can certainly put our sail up and try to catch some of it, but we can't control the breeze, so we just keep praying. And if you pray a little, sometimes a little breeze comes, and it seems like when we pray more, more of God's wind, more of the Holy Spirit comes. So we continue to pray, continue to pray. Lastly, the final obstacle is religious opposition. Religious opposition. It says, then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. Notice his prayer, nice and succinct. Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And, and the day on which this took place was the Sabbath. And so Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. Well, the law actually did not forbid him to carry his mat. That's the way the rabbis of those days were interpreting the Old Testament law. The Old Testament law said that you were to take a break of whatever you did for six days, you take a break. You don't continue doing that. You need a break. It's good for your health. Mentally, it's good for your spirit. It gives you a chance to, to recuperate. And so, but they interpreted it here. But really the issue was they were, they didn't, it was religious people against the God's healing. He said, well, religious people should be the most supportive of God healing people. You, I mean, that's the way I would think, right? But that's not the way it is. There's plenty of religious people, and for different reasons. I don't have time this morning to go into all the reasons, but there's a lot of, some people believe that, God did heal back in the day, but he doesn't do that anymore. That's, it's, that's, he turned that chapter, and he's kind of done healing. Now he's just doing this, maybe, you know, just winning souls. And then when we get to heaven, you know, we'll have new bodies. And this, is, this is predominant. I went into a, a bookstore a number of years ago here locally, a Christian bookstore, and I said, hey, I would like some anointing oil because the Bible in James says that you anoint people with oil and that's part of the way God brings healing. And they looked at me like, anointing oil? She, and the lady goes, we don't sell that here. Kind of squinted her eyes, you know. <laughs> like, how dare you even ask that question? Who do you think you are? Not everybody believes in, in healing. And so they, they're, and, and sometimes it's the religious folk. And they'll look. In their Bibles, they'll find things that they feel justifies that or supports that. But there's plenty of people that say, no, no, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, God doesn't heal. And one of the religious philosophies that can creep in, it's a heresy, but it's a philosophy that, is, that, that says that if you don't ask God for healing and you suffer with that, you're, that's actually more holy. You're, you're doing something greater and more holy and more pleasing to God if you suffer through your illness and you never go to God for prayer, for healing on that. And listen, this is not true. That is a heresy. No matter how long we have suffered with our illness, we can still go to God and ask for prayer and ask for healing. Now, certainly Paul said that he went to God three times and he had this thorn in the flesh. There are thorns in the flesh. Like I said, we don't know the mind of God, but it doesn't, stop us, shouldn't stop us from asking for God to bring healing in our life. How do we regain 
divine healing. This is a birthright, uh, an authority that we should be walking in. Well, let me give you three different things that we can do. First is you pray biblical prayers. As I said, there's no magic technique, but certainly there's prayers that, that and there's ways to pray that, that Jesus instructed himself. He said, hey, when you pray, don't go on and on and on like the, you know, like some of these religious people do. He goes, just, you can just pray succinct. And so that's one of them. One of the ways that we pray, uh, biblical prayers, is, is we don't pray long prayers. Now, that's a, that's a blessing for some of you. You're thinking, oh, wow, that's cool. <laughs> I'm glad I can do that. <laughs> Short prayers are, that, that's in my recipe book. Well, that's good. You might look at somebody else and go, oh, wow, there's long, their prayer is so complicated and they use all those language and it's so flowery and, you know, oh, and I can't do that, so I must not. And actually, God likes short prayers. He says, pray short prayers. The Lord's Prayer is it the one that he gave us to pray. It's short. That's why it's easy to memorize. Short prayers can be very, Jesus said, when he, if you look at Jesus' prayers, they're often short. He'll just, just like the one we just saw here. We just pick up your mat and walk. He saw, just see Walk, be healed. Jesus' prayers are short, so we need to spend time listening to God, more time listening to God, maybe be less time talking. Don't, we don't need to inform God of the specifics. If somebody has a medical condition and they might go on and tell you about it, and they, they know all of I've seen many doctors, and they're, they're like miniature experts on their own illness. And they'll tell you all about it. And it's almost like, you know, somebody like reporting, like a doctor telling another colleague, you know, about this medical diagnosis. Well, you know, there's uh, this, you know, the, a cracked tibia and uh, there's ligament involvement and there's, you know, swelling of the knee and it's, in, you know, the arterial involvement. And that's not necessary. God knows all that. God knows more about it than the doctors know. And so when somebody's telling me about something they want prayer for, I just want to get the the just, you know, the basics, you know, the overall, okay, what do you want prayer for? And then I'll, you, it's almost always I say, okay, I, I've heard enough. I don't need any. God already knows it all. So you telling me more is not really going to help me in my prayer life for sure. So we don't need to go into the details and the specifics. You don't need to beg God. God is not like some stingy Ebenezer Scrooge, you know, or, or he's not, he's not trying to hold it hold back his blessings and you've got to grovel and you know, our prayer life really reflects our view of God if you see you, God as somebody who's holding back and real tight to his blessings and you got to wrestle it out and you got to grovel and beg that says something about what how you see God but see Jesus says no God is loving and kind and gracious and wants to give you good gifts because you're his child and then pray confidently it's so important you know pray confidently you don't have to be vague and beat around the bush you step the hebrews says step into like you're to the throne room of god praying confidently god i i, I believe in healing i want this I, there was a guy who came to me a couple weeks ago he's in the navy and he said you know uh it looks like i might get transferred could you please pray for me to stay here my we own a home here my family's here they're all settled in I said, I will certainly pray for you. And then I saw him the next week, and I, I said, I just want you to know I'm praying for you. And he goes, oh, you know, I thought about that. I decided I don't want you to pray for me. I said, well, why? He goes, because you might, you know, manipulate the situation and, you know, cause God to do something he doesn't want to do. And he goes, I've just decided I'll just leave it in God's hands, and, and whatever he wants is good enough for me. I said, well, God has a way of doing that, but... We also can pray and, and make a difference in, 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 in the spiritual realm. And I'm going to pray for you. No, no, I'm telling you, please don't, you know. <laughs> well, I still prayed for him because I knew that's what he wanted, and I knew his family wanted that. And so after about three more weeks, I saw him, and I said, hey, you know, uh, you know I, I've been praying for you. He goes, well, he goes, I told you not to, but it turns out I'm staying, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> but I believe we should pray confidently, you know, boldly. This is an important part of biblical praying. Jesus said, ask, and it shall be answered. Seek, and you will find, knock, and the door will be opened. Number two, practice healing. 
This is an important step where we actually do it. We train it. We get involved in praying for somebody. Here, if you pray for somebody and they get healed, especially if it's instantaneous, it, it has a way of getting you hooked. You start thinking, dang, man, I'm being used by God Almighty. This is powerful. No, now you don't make the mistake. They're thinking you're, you know, something special. God's just using us as a vehicle, but it is an amazing thing to be used by God, whether it's something grand or something small, even if they just have gradual or small increments of healing. Sometimes it's a breakthrough. Sometimes it's spiritual healing or emotional healing, and it becomes an incredibly exciting thing, but it always involves risk-taking because you can pray for somebody and then nothing happens, and then you kind of think, hmm, wow, I just made, <laughs> I made God look bad. Well, actually, you didn't. You made yourself look bad, you know, and you got to be willing to do that, to say, hey, I don't know why it didn't happen. I was hoping that, you know, you'd get, you know, you'd experience something more, more direct than this. God can take care of himself, though. So we need to be our, do our part of risk-taking. A couple of weeks ago, I was in L.A. with my family, Anaheim, at a Vineyard National Conference. So we stayed a couple extra days, went to Disneyland one of the days. At the end of the, throughout the day, we were doing this thing, these trading pins. I'd never done that before. Uh, they have like little Disney trading pins and you wear them on you and you swap them out. At the end of the day, I'd had my little collection of pins I was all proud of. And there's this gal uh, uh, that we bumped into. She's in a wheelchair. And so I started talking to her. She's had just recently come down with this illness about three years before. And now she's now in a wheelchair. She has uh, problems with her vision and some pain and and so and she's got this huge collection. She, with her illness, she decided to get into trading uh, Disney pins. So she had like a book, you know, she opened them up and all these expensive, amazing pins. It's a whole little world, you know, out there of, of pen trading. And I've got my cheesy little pins and, and you're supposed to trade. You know, I said, well, do you see anything here that you want? She looked, no, <laughs> yours aren't very good. <laughs> I said, really? Are you sure? She goes, well, I do like that. I had a little Eiffel Tower. She goes, I do like that Eiffel Tower. I go, okay, I got a trade for you. I said, how about this? I'll give you this. I took it off. I go, I'll give you this Eiffel Tower if you let me pray for you. She goes, okay, that works for me, you know. And she had already kind of said she wasn't a believer. So I, was, I wasn't sure she was going to let me do that. So I prayed with her. My family, we kind of gathered around, prayed for her right there in that little Disney store. I'd like to say she got up out of her wheelchair. She didn't, but she did say she, she felt like she felt something. I said, do you feel anything? And she goes, yeah, I felt like there was kind of a wave. She described some things in her own language that, you know, there's kind of God was doing something. I said, well, I'll continue to pray for you, and that's your pen. And every time you look at that, if you, as long as you keep it, just remember that, you know, that we prayed for you. Listen, when we're, as a Christ follower, I'm never off the clock. It doesn't matter if I'm on vacation or our, our, our grocery store shop. I'm always looking for an opportunity to practice my faith, which involves divine healing. So you practice healing. Look for opportunities. And then sensitivity to God's voice. If you look in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you see he, divine healing associated with faith. That you see it associated with compassion. You see it associated with power and authority. But in the gospel of John... He always makes the connection of divine healing to intimacy with God, being close to God, listening to him. A few verses down in that same chapter we're looking at, Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son, of, uh, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does, Yes, he will show him even greater works than these so that you will be amazed. So we can't do anything that God's not doing. And Jesus says this is the principle of stepping into divine healing. Where we say, God, what are you doing? That should be our first question. We're in this series, Hello, Holy Spirit. So when we are about to pray or pray for somebody, we say, hello, Holy Spirit. What are you doing? What do you want to do right now? And then we just pray. And we just, if the, Holy, if the wind is blowing strong, that's beautiful. If the wind's blowing a gentle breeze, we go with that. Say, God, what are you doing? And whatever he says, that's what we pray. That's what we do. Let's bow our heads and pray.
Well, Lord, I just, as we look at John 5, it certainly challenges our worldview. Because all of us probably have a healing pool that we believe if we got that, life would be better for us. Life would change. So we get trapped to thinking that's where our healing is going to come from. If my parents ask for forgiveness, if my husband or my wife or my boyfriend or girlfriend, if they behave a certain way, if my therapist has the insight that I need, if my, if, if I get that doctor that has, is more clever than the other doctors, maybe you've had an illness that's gone on so long it's now part of your identity. You've fallen into maybe either complacency or even disillusionment. You're saying maybe this is, you know, and the truth is you haven't prayed about it now for a long time. Biblical prayers are prayers that we pray confidently. We know God's sovereign will. One third of Jesus' ministry was healing. The other was teaching and evangelism. So God's sovereign will is that he brings and ushers healing into it, into your life. Let's pray like that right now. Heavenly Father, come. Blow the wind of the Holy Spirit for healing. We can do nothing on our own. We are just, just frail human beings. Most of us have just a small amount of faith and fortunately you said that's all that's needed a mustard seed of faith and so Lord we just pray you bring your hand of blessing Lord I pray for those who are sick who have gone to healing pool after healing pool Lord I pray that you bring your power bring your healing into their lives those of you who have had a prolonged chronic illness Lord, I pray in Jesus' name you break that, whatever it is. Let them see a breakthrough in their life, a reversal. If it's complacency and you're stuck with some kind of habit that you that you know is, is not your best, it's not your best walk with Jesus, the way you're, you know, the way you're treating your body or the way you're treating others. Say, God, today, I don't want to be caught in complacency any longer. If you've never put your faith in Christ, that's the first step. Maybe you've heard a number of sermons. It would be my prayer that today it makes sense. It connects for you. That Jesus Christ, he died on the cross, rose from the dead. The power of the Holy Spirit wants to come and change your life. That heaven portion of heaven will flood into your life when you just open your life up to him and you just do that right now through prayer just say Jesus Christ come into my life forgive me for my sin give me a clear conscience and the power for living through your Holy Spirit in Jesus name amen Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. And we'll see you next week.